Hey everyone, welcome back. If you didn't catch part one, in part one we went ahead and talked a little about Coca-Cola and just kind of some key things to understand because Coca-Cola, the company KO that trades on the stock market, um, isn't just a producer and manufacturer of bottled beverages. Um, they actually have an interesting model where they do a lot of stuff with independent bottlers. So we're gonna go ahead and pull together DCF real quick. The information for this DCF, if you're not familiar, it's going to come from the SEC website. So to get to that, you go to sec.gov. In the top right, you're going to hit more search options. Go ahead and type in the stock ticker. Filing type will be the 10K. That's their annual report. And then you can go ahead and open up the most recent one. And then here, there will be a section for financial statements. I believe item eight here, um, page 63. And we can pull this in. And that's what we have. If we look at our income statement, that's what we've populated up here. And they also break out. They give us a little bit more information um, around kind of their SG&A expenses. So they break out the SG&A line that's on the consolidated income statement and some of the management discussions. And they break it out, um, stock comp, advertising, selling and distribution, and then other operating expenses. And then I went ahead and calculated this as a percentage of sales. So this is going to be important as we kind of think about um, Coca-Cola's goal is to shift towards what they call their core, which is their advertising based business. So focus on advertising and less on the manufacturing of the product. So this is going to be moving their, their sales structure more to their um, concentrate operations, which is to the independent bottlers. Um, so you know, we would expect the selling and distribution expense to go down over time as that happens. And then for advertising to potentially go up other, this is just going to be more of like corporate costs, I believe, um, since they don't have actual selling general and administrative costs broken out here, this is going to be more of your corporate functions. I would, I would assume. And then for their revenue, they do give us the split between concentrate and finished products, um, in the management discussion. So I've taken that split and broken out their revenue as well between the two lines. And we can see their finished product revenue, right? We've gone from 28 billion down to 15 billion. Um, and then their concentrate from 16 billion to 18 billion. So we can definitely see there's a shift here in the, um, kind of split of their revenue. Something to note here uh, that they note in their financial statements is that concentrate revenue is going to be lower um, per case or per unit than a finished product, but the margins will be higher. So while we look at how their revenue has gone from 44 billion down to 33 billion, they are their net income has actually gone from 7 billion to 7.8 billion. So they've actually became more profitable in a sense. And I mean, if we look at this, really, the big drivers, SG&A goes from 16 and a half billion down to 9 billion. So while their gross profit is less, um, it's really probably most likely going to be those savings on the selling distribution, right? That's $4 billion of savings. And on top of that, you're probably going to save some um, other operating expenses as well from not having as many operations in that standpoint. So the first thing we'll do here is we'll go ahead and um, forecast out some revenue assumptions. And then from there, we're going to kind of make our best guess at what we think the SG&A is going to have to look at to support those revenue. Um, so I think the first thing we need to assume here is that in 2021, Coke will get back to pre-pandemic levels. Um, you know, I think their concentrate business took a big hit this year um, for kind of the soda fountain, which is going to be in all of your, your restaurants around the world, right? If restaurants were closed for almost an entire year, uh, you didn't have any, any sales through that channel. So I, I don't think it's unlikely that they will get back up to pre-pandemic levels. Um, so that would require about 15% growth to get back to 2019. Now, do I think they're going to sustain 15% growth going forward? Absolutely not, right? That's going to be the highest of kind of these last years. But if we look at, if we exclude um, 2020 here, the average is 6.3%. So maybe we set this at the historical average for now and kind of see what that looks like for the company. And then from the finished products, right? I mean, this has been decreasing from 27 to 14. Do I think they'll ever get it all the way to zero? Absolutely not. I think they'll always have some finished products that, you know, bottlers are in trouble. They have to buy out a bottler or something like that. Um, I think they'll always manufacture in some capacity themselves. Um, but maybe we kind of have this, I don't know, let's say decrease percent a year um, oops. Uh, 
until it kind of levels off into like a, you know what I mean, a flat business at, um, We'll just leave that at zero. We'll see what is. So yeah, I mean, going just a slow decline there and a slow shift more to the concentrate operations. We can see, you know, I think this is the trend they want to see um, is going from finished product operations. Um, they want to move away from that and move more towards the concentrate operations. So we'll have that modeled in. And I think to support this, right, if we're going to support the historical level of growth, um, if we take the average here, then I think we're going to have to spend the historical amount on advertising, which comes into about 11%. Um, so we'll make that assumption for now. We'll see how that kind of plays out. And then something here, I think we will see though, I do think we will see selling and distribution decrease as well. Um, maybe not quite at the same pace that we see. Um, so I think a half percent a year, you know, if we have these declining every year, kind of have this, right? We went from 14 to six when we saw a 50% reduction. So we saw that reduce as well by 50%. So um, we'll kind of have this number continue to decrease and slowly just dwindle down. Um, the other operating, you know, I think historically we've seen this averaging 13 to 14%. I'm going to just for now hold this. We'll assume no operational improvements there. And then the last piece here is just stock-based comp. Um, as revenue grows, I think, you know, issue less stock-based stock comp. Um, or, you know, what, maybe let's do this as an average because that does seem a little low. Maybe it was just down for 2020 due to the pandemic. So we'll, we'll average that out. And we'll see, yeah, 192, one, you know, right around 200, which is kind of right where they were before. Um, so this brings total SG&A as a percent of revenue, um, it's improving, right? We go from 32% down to 27%, and we'll we'll see how this kind of links up over on the on the DCF here. So we'll see that um, COGS is something we're still going to have to actually forecast here, so we can delete that out for the time being. And then other expenses as well, um, we'll have to take a look here. And I think that this can actually be adjusted down and I'll talk about that here in a second. Um, so first thing COGS, so historically COGS, when they say the concentrate business is at better margins, I think they're talking on a net income level and I think it's when they back out the selling and distribution expense because I believe this is mostly related to the finished product. So I think when we back that out, right, but I think our COGS, um, if we look, it's, Historically, it's been around 39%. So for now, we're just going to set this to 39%. And we'll see how this kind of plays out. Other expenses. So I think something to note here that we did talk about in the first video is they underwent a restructuring. And in this restructuring, I think I believe they said um, of this 853 million, I believe they said there was like 500 million of cost they would um, incur due to restructuring. So I think the 3% might be a little high. Maybe they did some restructuring back here, but um, I think I'm gonna average it between the two and we'll go with the 2% for now. And we'll actually kind of have this decrease like a quarter of a percent every year until it gets back down to probably, and then we'll level it off at 1%. Um, my thinking here is, I think this is mostly restructuring costs. I don't want to kind of make any crazy assumptions about how much they're going to restructure or not restructure in the coming years. Um, so we'll leave it like that. Tax rate. So Biden has actually, I believe there was an announcement um, today about a new proposed tax rate. This could go up to like 28% or something in the coming years um, if anything gets passed. But for now, we'll leave it at 21% because that's kind of the cor current corporate tax rate. Capital expenditures just kind of set in line with historical. And then I usually set depreciation 80%. The idea here is if your depreciation is more um, than your percentage of CapEx, then you're not investing in the business. And if we're expecting sales growth, there probably needs to be some sort of investment back in the business. So we'll kind of leave it like that. And we'll look at how everything's are kind of, how everything is coming out for now. 7% um, weighted average cost of capital. Obviously I think you could, um, you could, lower this or higher this, I think 
Coca-Cola is a pretty safe company. I don't think it changes much. I don't think you're going into Coca-Cola expecting a big return on investment. Terminal growth rate, 3%. That's probably fair. That's just kept up with inflation. And then if we look at this, so we get an equity value of one point or 168 billion. So if we actually look at their current market cap, um, they're trading at 229 billion. So there's probably some some guesses or estimates on the street that you know they grew nine percent in 2019. There's probably expectations that they're going to get back to um, you know this high growth environment. I don't know if that's true or not. I mean, obviously you could um, you could adjust some of this and see you know if we do this at two percent a year, and then we actually have the business grow eventually. It's back up to 17 billion. Your distribution costs probably need to be higher in these out years then um, to be more similarly aligned. So it'd have to be back up towards 3 billion as things kind of shift back. So, I mean, this would probably have to go back up to like 7%, 8%, 8%, something like that. And maybe this is 7%. Kind of keep it in line with the historical amounts, I guess. Um, you know, I I think it gets tricky. Um, and this line, you know, honestly, is probably better to look at as a percent of finished products. But if we do something like that, you know, you're still getting something similar here. So I guess you're going to have to assume more aggressive growth here than the historical average. So if we say this is going to grow, if we exclude what year is that? 2016. So now we're at a 7.6% growth. How does that kind of impact things? 186 billion. So, I mean, there's definitely a gap, right? So if you want to get to the 230 billion, you're going to have to believe there's going to be some pretty good growth on the top line basis. Another way to look at this, um, which is what I pulled together here, if you're not familiar with it, dividend growth model. Um, I think it's called like the Gordon growth. No, maybe that's something else. Anyways, uh, basically what it is, is it's the dividend in year one divided by your your expected or your required rate of return minus the growth rate of the dividend. So I've done that right here. I pulled the dividends from 18, 19, 20, 21. The growth rates 2.6, 2.5, 2.4. And then our WAC is our required re rate of return. So that's just linked up there. And then for, for now, I have this just linked to 2.4%. And then from here, you would take um, the dividend of $1.68 divided by 7% minus 2.4%, and that gets you a stock price of $36. So under the dividend model, you're also obviously it's trading at 53, um, a little bit lower, but you could, you know, maybe they're saying, hey, you know, Coke has lowered their dividend from 2.6% down to 2.4, just to be conservative with COVID. So, I mean, if we put this at, let's see what happens if we put this 2.6. Oops, not 260. Um, you know, barely barely makes a bump there. I mean, you probably need what four percent. Yeah, I mean, you need almost a four percent dividend, which you know that's probably not going to happen. So from the dividend growth model, you know, obviously there's still a little bit of a difference here in valuation. Um, but yeah, I mean, the market's kind of frothy in general. So for Coca-Cola to be a little frothy, you know, isn't anything crazy. And they're trading at, what, $44 share. So if you take 20% off their market cap, right, you take $40 billion off, call it $50 billion, right? Then they're trading at kind of that 180 And that was back in March 1st. Um, you know, they're trading kind of in line with our projections here. So I think it's really going to come down to, do you believe, you know, they're going to be able to continue to kind of grow this concentrate operations. And obviously there's some factors here we're not including if they really push to get into the alcoholic beverage space, um, which, you know, we've seen them re-enter the space in August of last year, I believe it was. We talked about that in part one. You know, there could be a lot of growth there and a whole new business line that we're not including in our model that you could include that could very easily push them up to a higher thing. So, you know, I think, from a, a safe stock play, Coca-Cola is probably, you know, a little overvalued currently. 
um, but it's just really going to be your conviction around uh, some of the some of the assumptions we make there. Um, but yeah, I'd love to hear your your comments or any questions you have. Feel free to leave those below, and uh, maybe we can get a good discussion going. So thanks for tuning in. Hope you found this useful, and um, see you in the next video.